Now, it's a great pleasure for me to be joined in the studio by a much appreciated and well-known face, not least to all of our Astro Day live viewers, as I'm joined by the three-time NASA astronaut, a veteran of two space shuttle missions, a former Google executive and co-founder and CEO of the nonprofit foundation B612 that was founded in 2002 in dedication to studying and detecting asteroids. And in addition to this, Dr. Ed Liu is also an executive director of the Asteroid Institute that is uh, part of uh, B12, B612. And um, he also, after his time at NASA, I want to add, Dr. Liu served as a scientific advisor to the White House and also to NASA on space technology and policy issues. Ed, always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Sabine. It's great to be here. And thank you for taking the time. I know you have a busy schedule as well, flew in yesterday. Um, I know also that there's a lot of exciting things going on with B612, a lot of projects in the making. We spoke about one last year already, the Adam, and involvement has happened there. I know that um, you recently announced a great, a groundbreaking computational technique tour, um, and that with the help of, if I understand, Google Cloud, and also running on asteroid discovery analysis and mapping Adam, is now being launched. And this is also to really, you know, track asteroids. Tell us more about this exciting project and why it's so groundbreaking. Well, what, what's amazing, what, what's, what's changing recently is the fact that in so many fields, computation is becoming more and more important, in so many, especially scientific fields. And what we're finding is that the, as much of the discovery part of, of finding asteroids is the building of telescopes, is it's turning out to be building the computational systems to analyze and understand that data. And so we're trying to make most use of the data that we have by having massive amounts of computation. And that's being built for all sorts of other purposes. So what Atom is, is really a, a system that allows you to find asteroids in and, and understand their orbits and so on, uh, sort of in the cloud, in the same way that you use Google Maps to navigate to something and share your information with somebody else, like, go here, and you send them a link, right? And, in, and there's a system in the back end that keeps track of all the images, all the directions, um, computes the, the route, and so on, stores it, and allows you to share it. Yeah. Well, that system doesn't yet exist for space. And so Adam really is this system that allows things like discovering asteroids to be done in the cloud and, and served up as a service. Um, things like uh, calculating where an asteroid is going to be at a future date, or calculating uh, what you would see from a certain location, you know, what a telescope would, would see from a certain location, or uh, even if there's like, if you see an asteroid, has it been seen before, and maybe we can get in orbit of it then, okay? Because it, you, you, the most important thing when it comes to tracking asteroids is calculating their orbits, not just that they exist, but where they're going. And because that allows us to know if uh, not only where it's going to be, but whether or not it might be, present a danger to Earth. Mm. So it's really about accumulating a lot of data. So you're utilizing technology, mm -hmm. and that's how we can also detect yeah. asteroids in a much more mm -hmm. exponential speed. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's both data, which yeah. is the thing that telescopes generate data. They generate mm. images of the sky. Mm. But what Adam does is it, it helps process that data, calculate that thing, serve it up, make it shareable, make it usable. Mm. And so it's that... It's the combination of this, these services of calculating things and, and, and making things useful, as well as the data, mm -hmm. that really, in the end, is going to make a map of the solar system. Mm -hmm. You have to have both. Yeah. It's not just a, a map is more than a pile of data. Yeah. That's the key. Mm. And also, I mentioned Tor. Mm -hmm. So for our viewers, can you sort of elaborate a, a bit about that? Yeah, Tor is what it is, is uh, a way of finding and linking dots of light, which are asteroids, in images of the sky, mm -hmm. taken at different times and saying that this dot of light, this dot of light on a different image, taken at a different time, even with a different telescope, and this one and so on, are really the same one. We know that because they're linked by a particular orbit, and therefore we can say that this is the orbit of an asteroid, uh, whereas before they were just disjoint points of light on different images. Mm -hmm. And I, again, if you look at a particular image of the sky, let's say the the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which opens up in a year. Mm. In any given image, there's going to be something like 5,000 or so asteroids, points of light that are moving in a single image. Wow. Now, remember that it takes an image every, every half minute or so. 
you know, so two images a minute, and then it does this, you know, 60 minutes for an hour and all night, every night for a decade or more. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of images of asteroids, but which ones go with which, you know, which ones, so where, you know, every point of light looks like every other point of light. Mm -hmm. And what Thor does is it helps, it, it, it identifies that this one, this one, and this one are all the same asteroid. Maybe this one was seen four years ago, this one was seen two years ago, and this one was seen last night. Mm -hmm. And that's an asteroid, you know, and, and, and maybe a whole bunch of other ones. And, and it links them together so that we can get, make a discovery that this is not just a point of light, but it is an asteroid. It'll have a name and a number, and it'll be trackable, and we'll know where we will be able to say at a future date, mm -hmm. that asteroid will be located here. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, if I read correctly, I mean, you've already, through this mythology, discovered like 107 asteroids that were unknown, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's, it's a tiny number of asteroids, truthfully. Uh, yeah. Because, but it shows that the technique works. Exactly. Okay. So that was just our first batch, mm -hmm. and it was, it was even only part of the first batch. So there are many, many thousands of asteroids which we are going to be submitting here mm -hmm. over the next few weeks, mm -hmm. months, uh, and years mm -hmm. uh, a, as we find them in. Uh, older data sets, and then eventually the new Vera Rubin Observatory when it begins operations uh, in a little more than a year's time. And, and because you have such a broad spectrum, I mean, both to your knowledge and to your experience, and, and this is one of the projects from the sort of the B612 Foundation, what else is either in the pipeline or do you see in the near future as a necessity when it comes to, you know, planetary defense, space uh, exploration, and, and so forth? What is needed? What's the next step? Yeah, well, we're really concentrating on this uh, open source mapping platform that will allow people to uh, make best use of the data we do have, as well as um, analyze it and, and, and make it useful. Mm. Okay? Because in the end, as human beings move out into space, as we uh, develop the things in the solar system, besides just here on planet Earth, mapping is going to be crucial. In the same way that, you know, if you look at the 14, 1500s, what were humans trying to do that it was so important? Why were they sending Columbus and, and Magellan and all these explorers around the world to map the Earth? And it was because the, the opening up of, you know, all this sort of unknown territories requires maps. And the same thing is going to be true of the solar system. So as we, as a species, move out into space, the, these maps of space, and again, a map is more than a pile of data, but this ability to understand what's going on and to build services based upon where things are in space is going to be very, very important. Mm. And, and sort of on a, both a personal and professional note, because you've seen, you've orbited the Earth, you've seen the Earth from afar, and I've interviewed a lot of astronauts, and nearly all of them get some kind of insight, consensus, or something from that sort of visual and that emotional connection. And I'd just like to ask you, what would you like to convey looking at the world as it is today? I mean, we live in a sort of instable, um, geopolitically instable world. What, what, what advice would you give having seen the Earth from afar and, and the beauty and the potential of it and its inhabitants? Well, I think what's amazing is the fact that there's been this natural process going on for billions of years on planet Earth. The Earth has been hit hundreds, thousands of times by large asteroids. You know, the moon has too. You can see the craters on the moon. The Earth's craters have been mostly erased by weather and oceans and things like that. But the Earth's been hit more than the moon. It's bigger. Um, we could actually stop that process on planet Earth, protect our own planet. And that's amazing because, you know, a life form on that that evolved on this planet is actually at the point where it can then change the future evolution of the entire planet in a way such that it doesn't get hit by, by large asteroids anymore. And I think that's amazing. In fact, we have to do that. The long-term future of humanity does depend upon that. And, and we are just at that point where we're capable of doing that, right? We, we have the telescopes, we have the computation, we have the, the, the know-how to understand you know, where these asteroids are to, to be able to find and track them. And we have the technology to, to slightly nudge one if it's, uh, if it's on its way to hitting the Earth. You know, the, the DART mission will be an example of that next year. Yeah. Uh, or later this year, actually. And this is an amazing thing. Human beings have just crossed the threshold of being able to protect our planet. And we know with 100% certainty that we're going to have to do this at some point. I can't tell you when because it is a... Uh, you know, it's, it, there's a chance element to this that you don't know when the next one is until you find it. But we're going to find one at some point, and we're going to do this. We're going to protect the Earth. And it, 
it's all because of the work being done today by scientists and engineers around the world. I think that's really amazing. Yeah. So when I sit back and I think about you know, looking at the Earth from space, and I, I think of the amazing fact that human beings can actually protect this planet. Mm. Well, that's a great shout out to everyone out there. You know, we do have the capacity to protect the planet. Hopefully we can start to protect ourselves and concentrate on that kind of defense. But thank you and, and all the team around you and all the scientists and researchers around the world for all the important work that you're doing to really keep us um, safe and healthy here on the planet. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you.